Hey, it's Phil. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. And his dancing oranges. And Drew Dick. Hey. Now, how's people going? listening aren't going to know what you're talking about. No, Sky has two clementines in front of him that he's peeled and is playing with. And we don't know why. He's making a mess of the studio. Desk. I, mean, I think the studio is enough of a mess without me. Ha ha, very funny. Uh-huh. And Drew is here because Christian is having back surgery this week and is out for three weeks. And we'll see her when she's back. Uh, so, I got a, a request from um, I got a request from Anthony Thompson. Said, "Great podcast. Since Christian's going to be gone for three weeks, I think it's time for her to watch the podcast she wasn't there for." Sky listens to the podcast. He's not on. And that's probably not going to happen because she's not here, so she's not hearing the request. So she's probably not going to listen. But anyway, thanks. And then he goes on to say, "Phil, can you sing the theme song as Broadway Bob?" Broadway Bob. I didn't know what that was. I had to look up because he posted a clip, and it was it's a new uh, Veggies in the House episode where with Larry Boy, and they can't find Larry Boy, and everyone has to sing for Larry Boy to come, and Bob sings dramatically, which means falsetto. But just, I want to hear it. But just at the end. So anyway, that's what we're that's what we're gonna do today. Let's hear it for Anthony. This is for Anthony. <laughs> this is going out to Anthony. You stay special. <clears throat> hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. Hey, it's a podcast, and we've got video. What? <laughs> what is wrong today? Something's not right. Oh, let me do that again. <laughs> hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. I'm not even doing it as Bob. <clears throat> hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky. Hi, Bob. And Drew Dick, too. What's up, Bob? We've got no Christian. She's having back surgery. Not for you, but for her. We think, hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. That was the Broadway, nice. that was the Broadway part. You could nailed you, it. Could you do the podcast in falsetto? Oh, yeah. I don't want to show off, though. If I had hair on the back of my neck, it would have stood up right then. <laughs> you don't have hair on the back of your neck? Do you shave the back of your neck as, as well as your A lot head? of people don't know this, but I'm a competitive swimmer. Really? So I shave everything. I did not know that. And mm-hmm. my dog buddy is here again because um, my wife is out of town. So if, he, if you hear barking or moaning, whining, it's probably Sky. If it's not Sky, it's Buddy. The Oscars. Yes. Ah, We're recording yes. this the day after the Oscars. We, and we all watch the Oscars. Big impressions? Um, I, Did they leave an impression? Yeah, there were a couple things that left an impression. Some things I wish I could unsee. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> Lady what, Gaga's You know, uh, I actually, no. I, 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 <laughs> I was just going to bring up Lady Gaga and how uh, nice it was to see her use her, her, her musical abilities without yeah. just becoming a, a scandalous yeah, if parody. Yeah, if you didn't see it, Lady Gaga sang the tribute to the 50th anniversary of Sound of Music. And channeled her. And she can sing. Julie Andrews. She can she sing. Can sing. She can I didn't sing. Know that. She went to no Juilliard. Idea. And clearly she's trained and clearly she was, you know, like a drama girl in high school and, and did musicals and stuff. So and she was like appropriately dressed. Yeah, but here's my question. <laughs> in a non edible yeah, garment. Know, and she didn't have crazy makeup on. She didn't have she was just trying she did it straight. Yeah. She did yeah. it straight. So yeah. here's my question. If Lady Gaga is gonna do the tribute to the sound of music straight, would there have been a better choice? Uh, Because there are lots of people that can do that straight and probably do it better than she did. But we wouldn't be talking about it right now if Ah, it was someone else. Right. So if it was uh, Adina Manzel, uh, Howie Manzel, uh, (laughs) Adina, in in, um, Makuna Fasa. Elba Idris, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> if it was Elba Idris, do you think we'd be talking about her? I right would now? be. You know what? I would, have, I would sure. have liked to see the sound of music lady. I forget her name. Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. Sorry, okay, Julie Andrews. Come out in like a meat dress. That the would have been dress? kind of, yeah. 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 You know what I mean? That would have you been. Would have, uh, switching the, roles. The yin and yeah. The yeah. Yang. Right. Uh, that's just yeah. me, maybe. Maybe not a good move for her uh, career, but. What yeah. did you think of Neil Patrick Harris? As the host, I missed the beginning. Was friendly. I missed no, the, the beginning. beginning. Was the best part. Yeah, I missed In fact, that. the beginning was really the only I, good part. Yeah, I missed the beginning. I, too. You I, both missed the yeah, beginning. Yeah, 
I was rather disturbed because I was watching with my 13 year old daughter. <laughs> yeah, so the, <laughs> no. the tidy whitey, the tidy whitey scene. Yeah. That was not needed. And you hadn't seen Birdman. No, so but I heard about even, the scene. You didn't I know even. I know the reference. Appreciate how closely they tracked to the actual scene. That's what it was a recreation of the scene in Birdman. I know. Yeah, where he's like running around. But yeah. 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 I, how many of the uh, best picture nominees <laughs> did you see? Zero. Zero. <laughs> And this has been part of my problem over the last number of years. And Which I've, one do you think is the most Christian? Hold on. I really don't know if this is if this is a reflection of the Academy Awards or me yeah. and my stage in life. But the last number of years, I have maybe seen one of the nominated movies each year. Now, wasn't, See, wasn't yeah. Imitation Game one of the nominees? Yeah, I still yeah, haven't you seen didn't it. You see that. I haven't no, seen you it You didn't yet. see that. Uh, I didn't see it. I really want to. Okay, yeah, American Sniper. Neither of you saw American I Sniper. I tried to bring my wife on Valentine's to American Sniper. Oh, and she wanted Fifty I Shades it was of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Shh. Drew. It's Valentine's Day. Hey, we're Christians. It's all about Fifty Shades of Grace. Oh, wow. That's yeah. good. And, and that's you, your wife's name. That's my wife's name, too. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grace. Yeah. And, no, um, here's the problem with the Oscars, okay? Yeah, okay. And someone that was okay. over at my house, I had a friend over, um, yeah. said it. But he said, what it is, it's famous actors that we know giving awards to people that we don't know. Oh. oh. So you didn't know Julianne Moore? <laughs> well, there were a few exceptions, <laughs> but it's mostly like obscure French guys. Yeah, no, a lot of them were Mexican. A lot of the awards yeah, yeah, went to Mexico. Well, the directors. Yeah. No, and that's great. That's directors. great. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. You know, Speaking a lot of, of these movies yeah. are pretty Sean obscure. Sean Penn. Yeah, his funny green Ooh, card joke. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's gone over very well. No, it, it hasn't didn't. Gone over, no. But, but he and the director are good friends. See, that was the missing thing. So if you're good okay. friends, you can make racially yep. insensitive comments, as often occurs here on our program. Yes. You can, you about can my Canadian heritage? Is that what you're talking about? friends, the question is, should you joke with your good friend in a racial way in front of several billion of right. your and less good friends? I think Sean Penn has... has Liberal credentials, yeah. pretty yeah, solidly he, established. He I wonder how it would People have been. People still got mad, though. It, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I wonder how mad they would have gotten if it was Clint Eastwood Ooh. who Ooh. said it, or Sonny Bono, <laughs> or or Charlton Heston <laughs> or Char <laughs> from the grave, <laughs> or, or Mike Huckabee. Oh, oh, if yeah. he was nominated for a, an Academy Award <laughs> right. for, um, I think he was in the crowd. Best presidential best candidate, best score. <laughs> Best uh, <laughs> adapted screenplay. Okay, so you hadn't, you didn't see guns, grits, and God. Neither of you saw the Grand Hotel, Budapest no, Grand Budapest Hotel. No, no. I'm Phil, not that cool and quirky. We are just, Christians. Yes, don't, we don't go to movies. I guess not. So you see, like nothing no. but Marvel films. We're parents. That's true. That's Our kids know. are a lot younger than yours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're only yeah. going to. You're only going to movies with the entire family. I did. Or see you just have you shifted your personal viewing more to TV? I'm busy. Mm. No, you're not. I am. You're barely employed. That's also true. <laughs> but I'm really busy being barely employed. Okay. Um, I I think the only movie I saw that got an Academy Award that I recall last night was was Big Hero Six. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where I went, yeah. With my so that kids was with your that. kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you're one up on me. And you didn't see the one about the wrestlers and the crazy guy, the fox catcher. No, no. I didn't see oh, that. I, I kept hearing that, this though. about this Whiplash movie last night. I'd never even heard of it before no, last really? night. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh well, I'd seen or the, Ida, the trailers because uh, they were on the front of a couple other movies that I saw in the theater that were nominated. Well, you're just so cultured. <laughs> I'm, I think I'm getting out of the house a little more yeah. than you are. You or you're going to a lot of basketball games I am now. going to a lot of basketball. My diminutive children okay. are on basketball teams. Okay, well, answer this question for me, <laughs> you two. Who, now, this was our special talk about the movies and the Oscars episodes, mm. and neither of you saw any of them. Yeah. Just from what you saw in the Oscars, which of the movies are you most interested in watching now? Do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, well, American Sniper, but that's just like okay. That was because I've heard about the buzz. That was before the Oscars. That was before. Yeah, there's a lot of buzz. Yeah, yeah. nothing changed. Which, what intrigued you though that you saw at the Oscars? I guess I'm a little intrigued by Birdman. Okay. You know, I saw Birdman, but it does have Birdman that kind of smack of self-congratulatory Hollywood, like yeah. those movies they make about themselves. Yeah. Kind of like Argo. Yeah, it's kind of an anyway. inside joke. Sure, yeah. sure. But, it's a, but I'm pretty Hollywood, so I think I'd get it. You are yeah. pretty Hollywood. That was your nickname in high school, wasn't it? Mr. Hollywood. Hollywood Drew. <laughs> okay. How did you know? So, uh, did anything intrigue you? 
Uh, you did, there, there are there are some movies that were nominated that I've always wanted. To, I do want to see Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm -hmm. I want to see American okay. Sniper. I want to see um, The Imitation Game. Birdman. I've kind of been. It's one of those like yeah. Michael Keaton. I heard an interview with him recently on the radio, and I, I thought that was intriguing. But it does feel like one of these artsy fartsy movies yeah. mm -hmm. about artsy fartsy it's, people. Yeah, and I'm not sure I really want to spend my time. He's yeah. still Batman to me. I, uh, my wife and I saw it in the theater, and yeah. neither of us were wild about it. Yeah. Oh, really? It's it's, oh, okay. it's, it's kind of avant-garde, you know? Mm -hmm. but, and it's mm -hmm. cool how they did it, because huge chunks of it give you the impression it's a single take. Right. And almost I've heard that. almost improvised, which it's uh, not, and it yeah. wasn't, but yeah. Yeah. it's it's kind of impressive. So a filmmaker sense, would look at it and go, that was hard. Yeah, that was really I need to read to about how they pulled that off, because yeah. that was... But then, you know, I mean, the, the first scene, the opening scene... Is him in his dressing room uh, before he's going out to try to direct some actors, you know, at this little theater, um, and he's levitating about a foot off the ground <laughs> in his dressing room, <laughs> and it's never addressed and it's never explained. But what? then other things float in the movie. Okay. And and in one scene he flies. He takes off and flies around New York. And is, are these visions? Are they dreams? Are never they... addressed. You don't know. Never, never addressed. All right. So okay. it's that kind of okay. film. Fine. Yeah, I'm more, happy for them. You know, Pan's Labyrinth. That's a little yeah, more it's out there. Out there. Also, by the way, by a Mexican director. You know, so that's there seems yeah. to be there's and this is the second year in a row. Best director has gone to a Mexican director. What oh. was it last year? Gravity. Oh, oh that, Who yeah, that? that's right. Uh, 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 Kieran, 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 another Mexican director. <laughs> That was a like John Travolta <laughs> moment right there. So, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, yeah, that was kind of funny. He did pretty good. Uh huh. You know what the Oscars needed more of though? Could, you know what? It's people calling Wes Anderson a genius. <laughs> I w <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. the part I didn't get with John Travolta, I was, we have a fairly new HD TV. And, yeah. And some people just shouldn't be on HD. Because yeah. I could like see every plug of I his think hair. He's had work done. Oh, he's had work done. Oh my god, he's had more work done than Gumby. Is he? he looks like a wax figure of John Travolta. He looks yeah. like a bad wax figure of Vinnie Barbarino. Yeah, I, I felt like Welcome I was at Madame Cotter. Tussauds. <coughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine being Adina Menzel? Yeah. What's her name? Getting mauled by <laughs> being that close and having yeah. him on it. It's not good. Yeah. Anyway, okay. What yeah. else? What else? What else about the Oscars stuck out to you? Neil Patrick Harris, you think he should do it again? Who was better, yeah. Neil Patrick Harris or uh, what's her face? Um, who did it last year? Was it was Tina, it Tina Fey? Fey? No, they did the Grammys. No, right? they did the Grammys. No, uh, Ellen. Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres. Was that last I think year Ellen's better. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't. I just they all yeah. fade together. I think Ellen was better. I liked his one joke about Edward Snowden. That was yeah, kind of no, funny. That's, that's I don't think for some I, treason he couldn't be here. Yeah, I, that was pretty good. <laughs> it's just a bad pun. I know. You've been, but you've been in the office funny. of CT I, too I long. Have, you're like, right. It was a pun on, on uh, uh, Reese Weatherspoon's name oh, too. Oh yeah, that was that bad. Was, I, I don't really think I've enjoyed the Oscars nearly as much since wait was it back in the '90s when Billy Crystal used to do mm -hmm. them? Yeah, yeah. those were good. Yeah. He's good. You're right. Oscars. Yep. Yeah. He and had. when Jack Palance would do one arm push ups, and I mean that was that was when the Oscars meant something. Yeah, you're sounding pretty old. I know. I am. You, you're, you're That's when it meant something, kids. Reminiscing the yeah. days of the Jack Palance one. For all this glitz and glamour. Yeah. I just, I don't know. It doesn't do anything. Well, you need to anymore. watch the opening number online because it was really good. Well, doesn't he, he's done, okay. a, uh, Neil Patrick Harris has done the Tony Awards a lot, hasn't yes. he? Yes, yeah, he And has. he did that thing with Hugh Jackman, anything you can do, I can do better. Okay, one I didn't time, see that but, on the Tonys. Yeah. I bet that was good. It was good. My dog is growling because a car just drove by. And so, he wants to defend the podcast. He's got our back. I, I I could have probably completely skipped the Oscars and done just fine with myself. But then we wouldn't have anything to talk too. about. That's true. We, we wouldn't have had this ran, scintillating conversation. It ran 40 minutes long. I yeah. was only able to watch it because I took a nap yesterday afternoon. Wow. That's, Again, you're sounding old. <laughs> I am an old man. Did you dream of Jack Balance <laughs> doing one-arm push-ups? Those aren't things I share. <laughs> Okay, <coughs> um, speaking of Oscars, or Hollywood, uh, Mars. Mars, did you hear? What? The, 
What does this have to do with Hollywood? What? It has what? nothing to do. Planet with. Hollywood. The uh, the company in where is that company? Oh, look, I got a message from my wife. Hi, wife. Um, that company in what is it? Is Sweden that wants to send people to Mars? Oh yeah, I heard about this. Yeah, Mars One. And they, they're narrowing they down their the finalists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, when did Sweden get a space program? They don't have one. They have to raise the money for it. Uh, and it's not Sweden. It's, it's, it's Do they put their someplace. spacecraft together with an Allen wrench? <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's our second uh, A hundred week. lucky dreamers are one step closer to achieving their dream of dying on Mars. <laughs> Mars won the private nonprofit hoping to establish a base on the red planet with the help of crowdfunding and a series of global reality show-esque media events has named its 100 final astronaut candidates. We've talked about this before. The invitation went out. Would you like to go on a mission to Mars? Um, fine print. We can't bring you back. I think we should be able to like globally nominate people. It's a one-way <laughs> trip to Mars. Who do we want to send? So, so they release some of their scientific stuff, like this is our designs, this is how it's going to work. Uh, a group at MIT did a study of it and predicted that the uh, the explorers, the settlers, whatever they are, would start dying off within 60 days because of poor oxygen scrubbing in the, oh. in the design. Oh. I didn't. I thought like we just can't bring you back. No, and you can live too. out your life. Yeah, oh, okay, there's okay. that too. That's there's, a really raw deal. Yeah, there's you got no, 60 days. There's no promise of well, you're never going to come back. We don't. Sure. We don't have the technology yeah. to bring you back. Uh, but you may only last 60 days, but it'll be fun. So do you know how many people said, ooh, ooh, me, huh. send me there to never, ever come back and to die in a space helmet? Uh, 202,000 people. Whoa. Oh. 202,000 yeah. wannabe Martian explorers applied at the beginning of the process. The group was quickly reduced to just over 1,000, then to 660, and now we're at the third round, which includes 50 men and 50 women. Now, these are not just all Swedes. No, no, they're from all over the world. 39 from the Americas, 33 from the U.S., uh, 31 from Europe, 16 from Asia, 7 from Africa, and 7 from Oceania, which is a new, new town. Yeah, so, but of the original 202,000, how did that break down, does it say? Were there, no. I bet they were overwhelmingly were they from, like, like Florida. It, uh, they're mostly from England because mm. people is like, the food here is terrible and the weather's bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, the remaining hopefuls are a colorful crew, including the 38-year-old guy from Poland who simply goes by the name M1K0 <laughs> and claims to be a Martian sent to Earth who would now be happy to help us explore his home planet. Oh, he's nice one of, of the finalists. Yeah. Uh, so he's... Yeah, I want to be locked in a capsule with him until yeah, I die. <laughs> yeah. So the remaining selection rounds will put the home. candidates into teams that will train at a facility set up to mimic a Martian outpost. So begins the reality show portion of Mars. And how many can go total? I don't know, five. Well, it depends on whether they raise the money. I don't know, five or six. Not very many. It's hard to put people in just to the I think moon, this is a big much PR less. stunt. It's, yeah, it's, uh, we want press for our right. reality show. So, it's but here's the thing, though, because we also talked about NASA doing some long-term testing for a Mars settlement. And they currently, right now, as we speak, have, was it eight people? Locked in a bubble in in uh, Hawaii on top of Mauna Loa, the big volcano above the tree line. Okay. Let him out. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that. Don't you remember this? I, vaguely. Uh, have you vaguely. been drinking? What's going on? I've been eating oranges. Okay. Okay. And and what NASA said was very. And they're going to be there for eighteen months. Hmm. And the only they can only venture outside of this bubble if they're wearing a full spacesuit. Okay. And they, and they have internet access, but it, you get a response after 20 minutes of a click oh. to simulate what it'll be like on Mars. That's like a form of torture. Yeah, it is a form. Uh, and, but still, people oh. say, ah, I won't do it. Hey, sign me up for that. Lock Why? Me, lock me in a bubble. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a little bit like, like having cold. Comcast. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Very funny. Hey, my, Ding. my dad works for Comcast. Sorry. He does it. I made that up. So, but one of the things NASA said was, uh, we're selecting for the opposite of what you would want for a reality TV show. We're selecting for oh. low drama. Right. We oh. don't, there can't be I drama. Thought, like, you want ugly steady, people. stable. Yes. So the people that, this is NASA talking, the people <laughs> that we want to send to Mars would make the worst reality TV 
because uh, there won't be any conflicts. That's the goal. So Mr. Martian there wouldn't make the cut. So now on the other side of the world, you have people saying we need people from Mars and they need to make good reality TV <laughs> or we can't fund the Mars mission. You know what would be fascinating is if both groups... It's a race, arms race. If both groups ended up actually going to Mars yeah. and, <gasps> and then surviving. And then having yep. a reality show. And then like... About Tens of thousands two. of years into the future, what kind of civilization actually develops on Ooh. Mars? But you put them on different parts of right. Mars. And then yes. they have having a... And then there's a war. A conflict and yeah. of civilizations. Yeah. And then one day they'll have a mythology about it and they'll go back into their records and realize it all started yeah. because of reality TV. Wow. It's like Pandora's box. It's like the Truman Show. Right. His life itself. If he was on Mars. Put mm -hmm. Truman on Mars. <gasps> Okay, so uh, keep that in mind that when the show comes on and you can see MK, M1KO <laughs> or K0, I'm not sure which. Okay, we also got a lot of feedback. Turns out our uh, listeners, I don't know if you knew this guy, mm. have opinions. I have heard some, did yes. You know, did you know that? Because we've been talking, I don't know if you know this, but sometimes we get stuck on a topic for a while, like we got stuck on the gays. For uh, a while, uh -huh, the gays. Until people said, "Very nice family." Stop talking about the gays. Uh, uh -huh. and then we got stuck on the atheists mm -hmm. for a while, and then people said, "Stop talking about the atheists." Mm -hmm. And they said, "Stop talking about the gays or the atheists." My dog is growling at the door. Maybe if you drop the the, it wouldn't be so bad. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No. Then we start talking about the Muslims. Ah, uh ha -huh. Muslims. It's like a potpourri of problems. <laughs> <laughs> problem, problem potpourri. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, and, and people are just on the verge of saying, stop talking about the Muslims. But, but here we go. But here we so, <laughs> so we talked about the story that got a lot, of, a couple of stories got a lot of feedback. Uh, the president talking about, mm. you know, okay, Christians do bad things too, and people going nuts and mm. saying, blah, 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 terrible, worst thing a president's ever said, which I think is what the governor of, ex governor of Virginia said. Um, and that we didn't quite buy into that opinion. And then also we talked about the survey that, I don't know if you saw this survey, that almost half of senior pastors, Protestant senior pastors, will say that um, ISIS or the Islamic State is an accurate representation of Islam. Mm -hmm. And that, and we were a little bit critical of that. And, and so we got some feedback. Okay, here's some feedback. Uh oh. Oh, first of all, on another story, Bob Ford... <laughs> Thank you, Bob. This is helpful. Frigg is the wife of Odin and the mother of Thor. Rene Russo, remember? Frigg. I think they called her Frigga. Frigga? Yeah, Frigg is not a very feminine sounding no, I name. Think it's oh. Frigga. This is my or beautiful Frigga. wife, Frigg. <laughs> it's my friggin' wife. I didn't know who Frigg was. Frigg oh. came up in a story. Yeah, we were oh, talking we about know. Norse mythology. Yeah, Norse. Okay, thanks. Bob. Oh, and one other thing about Frigg. Yeah. Frigg's Day in Old English is where we get Friday from. No way. Yeah, so Friday, it's, it's Come on. TGIF is really thank Frigg, it's Friday. <laughs> thank, thank, thank the goddess Frigg. Frigg, Frigg for it's Friday. Frigg and Friday. Thank, thank the Frigg. goddess Frigga for Friday. Thank a Frigga for Friday. Woo! Right. Say that Find five the times fast. And the pizza. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Uh, now, here we go. Uh, Islam. Wee! John Golden says... The Christian characterization of Islam is Islam is self-serving. We want to condemn it and look for a reason. The reason does not make much sense for a religion that embraces Moses and Joshua, David and Solomon. It's true that Jesus went a separate way, but not his as in away from violence, but not his most powerful followers, Constantine, crusade popes, Charlemagne, Lutheran princes and the Reformation wars, Huguenots and Catholic League. Instead, I wish we'd look at our purpose now. Will uh, our purposes now will condemning their faith bring anyone to Christ or pointing out similarities? Connections and common ground. Mm. Ah, I, you know, well. there's something circling back based on that yeah. comment to what the president said. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, some people actually emailed me and were a little bothered by the fact they thought I was defending the president. And I thought I kind of went both ways. I said, oh, here's yeah. what I think was right about what he said, here's what was wrong. But one thing we, I, I think we need to clear up is the president said that in the past, things like the Crusades and the Inquisition and Jim Crow and slavery were justified in the name of Christ. And were attempted, were, whether yeah. they were successfully justified right. or and not. Is just on the face of it, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, there's nothing historically inaccurate about what the president said. That's absolutely true, that those things were 
right. sought to be justified in the name of Christian faith. Now, some people are like, yeah, 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 but you can't justify it in the name of Christ because it's not in the New Testament, whereas these things are in, in the Quran and therefore mm-hmm. can't be justified. Or Jesus said this and Muhammad said that. And, and I agree with all that. The difference is that the president was not making a comparison between Jesus and Muhammad. He wasn't making a comparison between the New Testament and the Quran. He was simply saying, some people are doing terrible things in the name of Islam, Mm -hmm. and in the past, some people have done terrible things in the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's factually true. Whether or not it's an accurate reflection of the faiths was not part of his conversation or his talk. So, Drew, did you you write anything or did you blog about the prayer No, I bit my tongue. (laughs) No, I mean, I... I was surprised at the the reaction in a way, yeah. because like Sky said, I mean, technically, what he said was true. I think it was a little tone deaf, mm-hmm. especially in the wake of the you know brutal things we've seen ISIS do recently. And when he said, you know, lest we get on our high horse, no, I am on my high horse when mm-hmm. it comes to I ISIS. I'm sorry, I think that's wrong. I think I have the moral <laughs> high ground. You know, I'm not a perfect guy, but when it comes to ISIS, yeah, yeah I so kind of look down was, on that. What do you think? So what I think do you think deaf, he but, meant yeah. by high horse that, that we start throwing stones at Islam well, as a whole? Here's having been in the room when the president hey, made yeah, those comments, I was no, actually you were there. hobnobbing with the Dalai Lama, no. or something you, like that. Hello, but Dalai. The whole his whole talk was about having humility and faith, yeah. sure, and and not coming to God with arrogance, but recognizing that there's doubts and there's humility. So the right. whole talk was about humility. And that we can all mess up. Yeah. And so yeah. Yeah. his high horse comment was really a, another point in his, we all need to be humble in our faith. And yeah, we want to point to these people doing terrible things, but we need to remember that in the past, we Christians right. did terrible things right. in the name of Christ. So we can all slip into error. In which case, I think that's a very Christian message, right? Right. And here's the thing, too. When you're the president, you have to say things like that, I think. I mean, you. I, for instance, some people have criticized o- Obama for saying, oh, ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. Mm-hmm. I think that's patently absurd. Of mm-hmm. course, they have something to do with Islam. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're the fair representation, maybe, of the majority of Muslims, of course. But as a, a politician, you're you're trying mm-hmm. to you know, you, you're giving rhetoric that's going to make people more peaceful, hopefully, right? I, right? Th- I think people, a, a few people have pointed out that 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 trend of trying to disassociate terrorism from Islam overall started with George Bush. Yeah, yeah, you and know, he'd always and talk about how Islam was right, a religion of right peace right and all this 9/11. stuff. And 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 the reason <clears throat> was whether regardless of whether they believed it mm-hmm. personally sure. was we have allies that are muslim nations yeah. and we want their help right yeah. Yeah. and if we if we paint with such a broad brush that we feel like that they feel like they're we're attacking their faith right. we've lost their yeah, help yeah, yeah. there's a number yeah. of strategic reasons why the bush administration used that kind of language and why the obama administration has continued it and i suspect the future president will do the same thing. And, and part of it is, yes, we have Muslim allies that we need to engage this enemy. But secondly, if you start using the rhetoric of Islam or, or the West versus Islam or Christianity versus Islam, you're only going to help recruit more and more people. Yeah, you play into their narrative. You play into right, their yeah. narrative. And right. that's just strategically stupid, even if some people here at home think that's the right, right way. To so but no, behind closed doors, like yes. you know, CIA, and so, like they when have you've to talk. Been with the president, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and some of your, you know, Barry will say to me, Drew. <laughs> Drew, now but, don't repeat this, Drew. Yeah. But here's what I Except, really think. Unless you're on the Phil Vischer podcast, yeah, then cut well, loose. And, th- and this is no. But when we talk strategy and stuff behind closed doors, we need to say, okay, what are the real causes of terrorism? What are its religious? You know, right. roots, and mm-hmm. the, you have to talk realistically. But as far as you know, a political speech that's heard all around the world, I get why he talks like that. And the, the point I was trying to make a couple weeks ago was when, when George W. Bush said essentially the same things, and I have all kinds of quotes about Bush saying far more positive things about Islam than I think Obama's ever said. He's doing it for political reasons, but nobody got all up in his chili about it because it wasn't part of his narrative. R- well, that, that he had the no I think evangelical. He, he was a conservative cred. Republican yeah, evangelical yeah, right. president, right. and so my point Whereas was that Obama's I think, a Muslim. I think that the the right. backlash Dang against it. Obama's comments weren't because of the comments themselves, because there's nothing right. factually inaccurate about them. And there's nothing that departs that strongly from what George W. Bush said. So the only conclusion is people are reacting because of who the person is that said it. Right. They don't sure. see him as a Christian uh, are spokesperson. Are we only upset because it's Obama saying this? Were we not upset when George Bush said roughly the same things? I don't know that he brought up the Crusades. 
Uh, well, he said repeatedly, we are not at war against Islam. Yeah. Islam is a mm-hmm. religion of peace. And, you know, he talked about his and Muslim friends. And they used the word and, crusade early on and, and then had to drop right. it very, very quickly <laughs> right. when they saw how that played in Saudi Arabia and right. Iraq. Okay. Becky Davis says, help me understand here. Uh, you say it's disturbing that so many pastors have come to this conclusion about Islam. Surely they have no idea what they're talking about. I don't think that was an exact quote, but that's her paraphrase of what we said. What, uh, what you are saying is that you have not come to that conclusion yourself, but you're not offering us any credentials for your coming to a different conclusion. Have you visited these countries or studied the Quran, Phil? <gasps> no. Um, I admit I have done neither, and I'm not sure what the deal is with Islam, but I've studied history, and Muhammad was not a peaceful guy. I don't know (laughs) what all these pastors are thinking of or what research that's going on, but from people in my circles, this is what's being looked at. Uh, Muhammad is the Jesus character of Islam, right? Not exactly, but kind of. People will happily point out that there has been much violence committed under the name of Christianity, and it's true, but if you look at Jesus and the New Testament and his message, it's way different than the message you get looking at Muhammad's life, actions, and message. I agree with a lot That's of that. It's technically true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but the, I think what we're, we're kind of doing apples and oranges here. Mm. Kind of oh, oh, oranges and orange oranges. Pills. You're waiting to the, weave that the in, The question that was asked of these pastors in the survey is, does ISIS represent an accurate depiction of Islamic society. Yes, that's the specific question. Right, and the majority of these pastors said yes, and my <laughs> simple thing... It's 47%. Well, almost half. So 47%. And that's just, it's demonstrably untrue. You can look at Muslim cultures and societies and communities all over the world, and the vast majority of them do not behave like ISIS. Right, but, sure. but, but, are they then... See, now here's a question. Can we put ourselves in a position to say, yes, but the Islamic State is a better match with... Well, what, like the Quran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With what Islam well, then was you're, supposed to be originally. That's a different question. That's the question of, does ISIS better represent Islam than other Islamic societies, not is it a representation of true Islamic society. I don't know. It gets under and the parts judging? of the... Yeah. Very, the I mean, there yeah. are... Complicated. Yeah, exactly. It's complicated. But to say that this, so this small manifestation of some really radical Muslims represents... Muslim societies in general is just insane when we have... Yeah, yeah I agree. And yet, on the other side, I don't... I get a little sick of the PC nonsense that says... You know, all religions can be hijacked by people that are violent. That's true. But as if they're equally susceptible to that. Right. Mm -hmm. And that there are an equal number of Christians that are doing that. Right. Right. There Um, there is clearly a a far greater problem within Islam today than Christianity. Exactly. And of course, you rewind the clock, it's different. Um, And this idea that that we have in the West that people only do things because they're motivated by, uh, you know, po- economics, poverty, socialization, right. and they actually don't look at their religious texts and are motivated to do things when I think they clearly are. It's a secular assumption. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. Okay. So a couple of our listeners uh, sent in links to articles that were quite good. Uh, one, the first one was posted on the Gospel Coalition. It's a blog post by Caleb Gregson, who was actually a missionary kid who... Uh, um, was once in a, a missionary school that was attacked by Islamic terrorists. So he's a little bit more of an authority than, say, he, us. He's <laughs> seen more than I have. And he wrote a piece for the Gospel Coalition website simply asking the question, does Islam inevitably lead to violence? And he first said, uh, that's not really a good question to ask. Let's come up with a better question. Here's a better question to ask. Uh, is there a legitimate place for violence within Islamic tradition? Uh, and he says the answer to that is clearly yes, mm-hmm. uh, that the primary means of determining uh, this right in Islam, the right to rule in Islam, is power. According to Islamic thinking, if you are in power and succeeding, then God is clearly blessing and supporting you. If you are not in power, not succeeding, then God has chosen not to bless you. Of the first four caliphs after Muhammad, three of them were violently murdered, either by assassination, mob, or in battle, all by fellow Muslims who supported other leaders. The first two Islamic dynasties came into power by slaughtering those who held power before them. Islam's history only gets bloodier from there since might makes right in a way that is foreign to the Judeo-Christian world. Okay, and so then he went on to clarify, let's talk about theology, and there are three principles that distinguish, that, that are reasons you don't see the same dynamic in Christianity. Um, 
the first principle he said is coercion and belief, that Christianity teaches that God wants heartfelt obedience and living faith. Therefore, we cannot coerce someone into becoming a Christian. All we can make through coercion is hypocrites. However, you can force someone technically to become a Muslim, though probably not a truly devout one. All five pillars of Islam are behavioral. Each one can be fulfilled without heartfelt conviction. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I agree with him. I do. But, the, the, you know, history is a little bit more complicated because there were, there were uh, manifestations of Christian culture in the past that tried to do external, yeah, sure. Con- but but it wasn't consistent. I would argue with what the New Testament teaches, right? And it didn't start with the, the founders, right? It wasn't the you know the I first generations of mm-hmm. Christians right. did not attempt to coerce anyone, right? Yeah, coercion, first three hundred years, in fact. Yeah, yeah so the, there were uh, corruptions of Christianity over the centuries that look a lot like what we yeah. are currently yeah. seeing. Yeah. In Here's Islam. an interesting quote from uh, Shabir Akhtar who says, ultimately, Islam will win worldwide dominion because Islam alone, and certainly not Christianity, is internally constituted to be an imperial religion. So a religion of empire. Yeah, that is an important point. I think, I mean, leaving aside the violence question, the difference between Islam and Christianity in one sense is that Christianity is a religion. Islam is a religion and a law. Right, mm-hmm. and, and it's government. very this right. worldly, right? And the key point in Christianity is when Jesus says, you know, define his disciples' expectations. My kingdom is not of this world, right? Right, and whereas is in Islam, that's not really thinkable that the kingdom is not of this world. You know, right. hey, save it for the next right. life, you'll be okay. Um, and so that does, you can't, you yeah. can't practice. You, Islam desires to be practiced is set up to be practiced societally. Yes. Not in yeah, to well, establish the Sharia why, and yeah. That's yeah. why However, the parallel with it, with Judaism is so much more interesting. Yes. Because yeah. the Old yeah. Testament Torah was set up for a people in a mm-hmm. land with right. a political center and you know a temple and all these practices and there was no way of conceiving of being Jewish in the Old Testament or, or an Israelite in the Old Testament without the land, right. without yeah. the temple, right. without all that. So when they eventually lost the land and they lost the temple in 70 AD and they were scattered throughout the empire, you had this reform of Judaism mm-hmm. where they took the Torah and they said, okay, now that we don't have a temple, we don't have a land, how do we practice our faith? Right. And they came up with a reformed model of Judaism. Well, Islam has never mm. done that. Yeah. You know, they, they don't have a sense of, well, how do we really be truly Muslim without a caliphate? I mean, people have, but there's still this sense of we need to regain it. And there's a lot of resentment that they, I mean, people forget Islam was the Colossus of the ancient world. It wasn't Christianity. Mm-hmm. But then the Enlightenment, things happened, and the Western the middle, world kind of... Middle kinda, Ages. Yeah, in the Middle Ages, not exactly. the ancient world, because it didn't exist in Sorry. the ancient Sorry. Yeah, world. no, no, I, not yeah. ancient. I mean, I'm yeah. saying ancient uh-huh. as in... Medieval, Middle ages. <laughs> Middle okay. ages. That's ancient to me, okay. But um, but Phil, then the Phil's Enlightenment. Been around a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I go You're showing back. your age, Phil. <laughs> yeah. No, um, but then the Enlightenment happened in the Western world, and that really uh, put the Christian world out ahead of mm-hmm. the Islamic world. And it's so weird when you read the the statements that come from ISIS and Al Qaeda and stuff. You realize they're still in the medieval era. They're using terms like the Crusades, and there's a lot of resentment that they've been left behind mm-hmm. because their religion is so this worldly. Okay. Uh, Caleb's second point, land. Mm. There is no such thing as a Christian nation. Ooh, that's even <laughs> scary to say, but that's biblical. Mm-hmm. There is no such thing as a Christian nation. Uh, has he been to America? <laughs> America? America? Well, he didn't grow up in America. Oh, well, so that's the problem. That may be uh, because the new heavens and the new earth have not been fully inaugurated. There is such a thing as a Muslim nation because every piece of land that belongs to a, to a Muslim nation belongs to Allah. So when Christians grieve the decline of Christianity in places like Europe, uh, we do not legitimately go to war to reclaim it for Christ. Instead, we pray and evangelize. However, when Muslim lands become less Muslim, there is a direct, that is a direct affront to Islam that must be redressed. That's the difference number two right. these come up with. Okay, we're not... A pe- and that's why I get a little concerned when, when we go nuts about, you know, this is supposed to be a Christian nation, because mm-hmm. sure. that can lead to so much trouble. And, and some of the worst things that are happening in the world right now are basically people making that same argument uh, from the viewpoint of Islam, not from Christianity. Mm-hmm. You know, say, you really yeah. want to think the same way. 
And then finally, uh, it's a, that it's a, a religion or a culture of honor and shame. The importance of honor is a key cultural difference between the West and most Muslim countries. Rejection or mockery of Muhammad or Islam is a personal attack on every Muslim. And that is not the case in Christianity. So, mm. so what are we to conclude from this? See, I, I would agree with his assessment based on, on the scriptures, I believe that. But like Sky pointed out, not, not you don't have behave. to go... What's that? Not how we behave. Well, yeah, and if you go back in, into history, just you know, not too far, you can find Christians doing all kinds of awful things and not just mm-hmm. saying, well, you know, we'll just evangelize and, and right. hope for the best. But, and, and it's yeah. funny because the, the honor thing was a big motivator behind the Crusades. Hmm. That uh, you know these these heathens have taken Jerusalem. Yeah, that's right. Our sacred Jerusalem mm-hmm. yep. belongs to Jesus. Sure. So they have dishonored Jesus. We need to win it back. Yeah. I, I think where where people want to have the argument though is based on each faith scriptures. Yes. To say that right. well the yeah. New Testament doesn't justify any of that, whereas the Quran or its uh, accommodating scriptures could justify this stuff, and that may well be true, but. That's beside the point. When you look at the full history of Christian faith in the West and the full history of Islam in the world, it's a mixed bag. But it's not. It's sure. not beside the point. It's not beside. It's not. Well, well, but, it's but, not but beside here, the point. I, I think if we want to have a discussion about an intrinsic teaching of Jesus versus the intrinsic teaching of Muhammad, yeah. Hands down, 100 yeah. percent, Jesus' teaching is far and away superior, in my view, obviously, and and far more. Uh, beneficial to humanity, but the way that people in the name of Jesus have behaved for right. 2,000 yeah. years yeah. Right. haven't always been all that great, right. and, that, and that's a departure from his teaching, I believe. But I have friends who are Muslim who would not say we need to take over the land yeah. for Muhammad mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. for Allah, and we, we, we to, don't think we need, we to, need be, to have some of them on the podcast. We probably do, but that's my point, is you can't paint either community with a single brush. You can't say all Muslims want to do this or all Christians want to do that. You can look at their doctrines and teachings and compare them, and that's fair enough. But it's, I think we get into dangerous territory when we extend that to whole communities. But when when we're trying to figure out, you know, because I I, I was interacting online with a uh, uh, atheist at one point, my dog's trying to crawl up in my lap. He really wants to be on the show again. (laughs) Um, I was interacting online with an atheist at one point who posted a blog post that said Christians cannot say uh, that Westboro Baptist is not Christian. They simply cannot build that case. Uh, you know, and here was why. Mm. And at first I thought, that's absolutely ridiculous. I can build that case in you know, three notes. Um, and, and, but they had a pretty good argument, and, and they, they referred to uh, Russell Brand interviewed one of the leaders of Westboro Baptist Russell Church. Russell Brand, the actor? Yes, the comedian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I he, saw Katie that. Perry's yeah. ex-husband. He, yes, Katie yep. Perry's ex-husband <laughs> interviewed one of the leaders of Westboro Baptist Church uh, and, and had them argue as to why they were showing the love of Jesus mm-hmm. yeah. by their protests, why that was showing God's love. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, then it's hard to say... It, it, it's a little hard to explain why that's not... How you show love? You got to own your crazies. Not, That's the you thing. You got to, yeah. And but everybody, <laughs> I'm almost. You can come up with a justification for almost anything. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's it's, a, yeah. It's important to remember that the founders of Westboro Baptist are all lawyers. They're, they're like the whole family are trained. Yeah, that's well, right. See, now yeah. they're not only making lawyers. Christians look bad, but they're not helping lawyers either. <laughs> and as if they needed that. I know. Okay, um, and then we read one more article that somebody sent in just about the Islamic State because we have two uh, different yeah. things at play here. We have what you know, what does Islam actually teach, uh, and is it being reflected realistically? And then what is the Islamic State, and what are they actually trying to do? And this was uh, from the Atlantic. Fascinating. I highly recommend if you guys want to take time and really understand this, yeah. this whole if thing. If you've got a few days. You've got to read that article. <laughs> you've got to read this article. It's getting a lot of play mm-hmm. throughout the media as being now the definitive voice on how to understand ISIS. Here's just so. a few interesting quotes. In the past year, President Obama has referred to the Islamic State variously as not Islamic and as Al-Qaeda's JV team, (laughs) statements that reflect confusion about the group and may have contributed to significant strategic errors. Uh, The Islamic State follows a distinctive variety of Islam whose beliefs about the path to the Day of Judgment matter to its strategy. 
So, and, and this is a really long explanation that mm -hmm. the Islamic State is actually steeped in Islamic theology. It's just a different view of Islamic theology, right. you know, than the more moderate. So, like, uh, just this week, the the president of Egypt said that we need to do a better job teaching Islam because there's too much extremism. Mm -hmm. So their point of view was, you know, and the and the leading Islamic college in Cairo has come out to say, no, this isn't true Islam. We need to teach Islam better because uh, it's leading to too much extremism. But at the same time, you can find roots that, you know, no, they are reading the Quran. They are pulling the yeah. stuff mm -hmm. out of the Quran. My dog wants to type on my computer. <laughs> He's waving to the fans at home <laughs> once again. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hi, microphone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and the, the the article goes on to talk about their particular theology is really an apocalyptic vision mm -hmm. that is trying to to draw into war the forces of Islam against the West or Rome right. or, so or Christianity. It's, it's so eschatology, right? So what, what is, I was reading this article a couple weeks ago, and as we keep saying, it's very long, and I had to keep pausing as I was reading this article because I couldn't believe. It's 2015, and I'm reading about this completely ridiculous, crazy, it's medieval kind mm -hmm. of stuff going on in the world, and these people mm -hmm. actually think this way. But the closest I could get is this, this kind of psychosis reminds me of the Nazis. The difference is the Nazis tried to hide their atrocities, mm -hmm. <laughs> whereas <laughs> ISIS is putting them up in social media. Right. And they're yeah, doing it propaganda. very intentionally because right. they, they want to draw the West into a ground war. And if we were to go into a ground war with them, they would declare victory right away because, it's see, we're fulfilling right. the prophecy. Right. This is what's so supposed to happen. Yeah. more right. extremists are attracted Which to also that. explains why President Obama, and I'm guessing our future president, needs to avoid the language of we're at war with Islam, or right. this is about Islam, because it's sure. feeding into the very narrative that ISIS wants to create. Right. It would legitimate them, yeah. Exactly, we, and they, they would get more recruits the moment yeah. a U.S. president says we're at war against But here's the, com the complication, is that possessing land also gives them legitimacy, right. and people are flocking to them because they're like, oh, the caliphate's being it's restored. Working. It's working. It's working. Right. They have it's land, happening. they have power, and that is... Powerful, right? Which for means people. if you yeah. can take away the land, you reduce their exactly. But right. you, one of the big conclusions. But to take away the land, you of course, you do a ground war. A ground war. Yeah. If you do a ground war, they say yes. It's just like it was supposed to happen. Sure. Now we have our yeah. ground war. So, so uh, tough situation. One of the conclusions is the reality is that the Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic. Yes, it has attracted psychopaths and adventure seekers, <laughs> largely drawn from the disaffected population of the Middle East and Europe, but the religion preached by its most ardent followers derives from coherent and even learned interpretations of Islam. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we just have to realize is that there's more than one interpretation of Islam. Just as there's yeah, more than one interpretation of, of Christianity or yes. Judaism or Hinduism or right, Buddhism. But, but, even, but I think they're more divergent uh, you know, and well, w within Christianity, there are there are groups that we would say, no, nope, you've gone off the ranch, right? Just you like know. the the school in Cairo is saying, those ISIS guys have gone off the ranch. I know, but the Shiites say that about the Sunni, and you know, so well, like, not too long ago, Protestants and Catholics yeah, didn't think the other was saved or part true. of God's kingdom. Like fifty years ago, sixty years, maybe ago? maybe in some places, it's five still years the ago, case, right? <laughs> 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 I mean, if you think back to the election in 1960 with John Kennedy, there was a huge controversy over the fact that he was a Roman Catholic. Right. No, it was 50 years ago. Yeah. So the Pope was going to be calling the shots I rest in the White my House. Case. Um, in the grand scheme of how, world history, 50 years is not that long. Today, ago. though, today, are there any Christian groups that would not sign off on? Uh, you know, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and say, you know, this is basically what Christianity is. Oh yeah. It, Absolutely. I mean, there there well, are there are mainline liberal Christian liberal, groups yeah, that right. won't agree with those creeds anymore because they don't believe in miracles. Well, that, but there is remarkable continuity between the three big branches of the church: yes. Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. Yeah. As far as the those and we staples, haven't yeah. killed each other in hundreds it's been of a while. years. It's been a while. <laughs> hundreds. Yeah. Not thousands, <laughs> but hundreds. And it should be mentioned that although, especially ISIS, has killed a lot of religious minorities, including Christians in the Middle yeah. East, mainly the Muslims right. are killing each other. <laughs> That's another. Yeah. Right, because they're the wrong kind of Muslims. Yeah, exactly. Which is exactly you what. You know, it was, that was fascinating about war. this article when the author talks about meeting with some of the key spokespeople for ISIS across Europe mm -hmm. and finding them very 
I don't know, urbane, erudite, interesting, Mm -hmm. even talking about enjoying talking to them (laughs) and how they are, I think the word he used was unstumpable when you ask them questions Mm -hmm. about Islamic doctrine. Um, So I totally agree with the main point, or at least the early point of the article, where he says to call them un-Islamic just doesn't ring true when you actually talk to these folks Mm -hmm. because they're deeply steeped in the traditions and the scriptures um, uh, of Islam. So... Again, behind closed doors, when you're talking strategy, how to understand them and ultimately defeat them, you have to understand the religious underpinnings of their worldview and philosophy. Yeah, right. Um, what, it, what it reminded me of is back in the when I was a kid in the 80s and there was all that, and maybe even more recently, all that fervor in evangelicalism about the end times, mm-hmm. about the return mm-hmm. of Jesus, mm-hmm. about the state of right. Israel, all that or dispensational. Even, even that we were, in some cases, we were witnessing, we were, right. we were doing missions for the purpose of bringing about the end times. Right. Yeah, so, you can actually uh, precipitate it, the second it, coming. If right. you think yeah. about right. how many how many Christian leaders and how many Christian lay people read all those books mm-hmm. about the, you know, Hal Lindsey, Late Great Planet Earth, all, and were steeped in understanding Christian uh, apocalyptic literature, the prophecies of the Old mm-hmm. Testament, the return to Israel in 1940, all that stuff was just saturating Christianity. Right. But the way it ended up getting manifested was pretty much two ways. One was political activism, mm-hmm. and the other was mission and evangelism. Mm-hmm. And tourism to Israel. And tourism. But there, but there was this fervency and this excitement and this yeah. anticipation. Yeah. Now, you take right. that and you transfer it to ISIS today, and it's that same sense of apocalyptic, the end is coming, our yeah. salvation is at hand, but the way it's being manifested is we need to kill people. Yeah. yeah. It's really Which more is horrible. Akin, right. Really, really yeah. horrible. But it's that kind of assurance and sense yeah. of, of rightness that is right. behind the It's more what akin doing. to the Crusades, because another reason the Crusades were launched, when they got to Jerusalem and took it over, they a lot of them anticipated that it would precipitate the second coming of Christ. Um, and so, and of course, they were willing to kill to get there. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's probably more analogous. But yeah, that's, um, and that's a, a key difference this article brings out too between even Al Qaeda and ISIS is that Al Qaeda doesn't have that same um, apocalypticism right. built right. into it. Right. In fact, they kind of think it's lowbrow. Well, sort they're anti West. Yes. More than... yeah, and they're a greater danger, imminent danger to the West yeah. than ISIS. Right. They're more regional. I mean, they hate us because, you know. Well, it seems like the danger of the, the Islamic State is when they make calls for, you know, kill someone yeah. in the West. They activate the lone wolves. Behalf. Yeah, and, sure. And, and mm-hmm. you know, individuals just go a little yeah. nutty. Uh, there's, so there, uh, the last thing I'm going to say from this article is uh, Princeton scholar Bernard Haeckel, who uh, is the leading expert on the Islamic State's theology, said, um, uh, Muslims who call the Islamic State un-Islamic are uh, typically embarrassed and politically correct with a cotton candy view of their own religion that neglects what their religion has historically and legally required. Uh, Many denials of the Islamic State's religious nature, he said, are rooted in a, quote, interfaith Christian nonsense tradition. Yeah. (laughs) That Hmm. we're trying to be so interfaith and non-offensive to everyone that we're unwilling to say, well, well, actually, I mean, it's like if, you know, there have been some critiques of some fringe Christian thinkers who have wanted to bring back Old Testament law, you know, who said, no, we should stone homosexuals. We should, Mm -hmm. you know, do this because this is God's law, who just read the the Bible ridiculously. Um, And it's it's basically the same as Mm -hmm. if that happened, as if you actually tried to do that, you know, and we we can't really say, no, that's not in the Bible. Sure. Well, it is in the Bible, but you have to know how to read it. Right. Yeah. You know, and the question with, with the Quran is, well, who who is the one who determines how you read this? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, could you imagine if some, some Christian leader today picked up the Bible and started reading about the conquest of the land in the book of Joshua or Judges yeah. and mm-hmm. said, you know what, this still applies today. These we need to go out and completely and utterly destroy every living being right. in a town I'm and take over, over this to... land and establish right. a I mean, we'd all be horrified by that. Go, no, 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 no! You're completely misreading See, in, in, the Bible. When I read the the, yeah. the novel Christian Nation, remember that one right. we talked about it on the podcast. One of the things that they predicted is is if you know the radical Christian right came to power, one of the first things they would do is bomb San Francisco to kill as many homosexuals as possible. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, but it's it's right. like well, here this is in the Bible, and I heard somebody mm-hmm. way out on some fringe radio sure. station or YouTube video. <laughs> say we should right. do that. So clearly that's a mainstream idea. And that's why it's so hard in, in someone else's faith tradition to separate mainstream from fringe ideas when right. you, don't, you don't live 
in that tradition. And ultimately, it's going to have to probably be Muslims that rein in extreme Muslims. Well, I think they're trying to by killing yeah. each other. Yeah. Though, which yeah. cuz who who thinks they are the extreme? Sure, that's a good no, point. Nobody does. <laughs> you, you know, you're I'm the orthodox and you're the heretic. Yeah. And so But to quote Bill Maher, which will probably be the last time I ever do this, <laughs> everyone should take out their own trash. And it's like and if there are Christians that are getting crazy, Christians should go, "Hey, stop it." You know? And well, ideally, that's, that's Muslims should do the same thing. <laughs> it, it is funny because we get criticized sometimes for criticizing Christians. Yes. Ugh. And we also sometimes get criticized for criticizing non Christians. It's like you shouldn't, you know, they're not Christians, so right. you shouldn't, don't look down on. And others people say, hey, well, you can't criticize your own people. You can only. Right. So we, so either, we can't criticize anybody. We either have to criticize everyone or no one. So you pick. Go with everyone. Mm-hmm. I'm going with everyone. <laughs> I'm just going with Canadians. <laughs> Not, they Bring never it get, on. They never, <laughs> Everyone does. They never fight back. <laughs> Did you watch the uh, Saturday Night Live 40th anniversary special? No, I missed it. It was I three know, and a like, half hours long. How did you miss it? Yeah, and it was like probably half Canadians on there, yeah, right? It was. Yeah, yeah, There was a whole lot of Canadians. Yeah, um, uh, Martin Short did a really nice musical piece. Did you see it? Uh, I saw highlights. I watched some of it online later, but I didn't watch it. Oh. Again, I have things to do. And you apparently Too don't. Too important to watch it, huh? <laughs> hey, America, can you guess why the world is a bit of a mess? Because we can't determine right from wrong, and I can't explain it in one little song. Because who's on the inside and who is out is a little bit relative. It's what I'm singing about, because nobody thinks they're an extremist. Any more than they think they're a dreamer who may or not be a realist. Wow. Anyway, see you next week. Bye. I thought you were going to get ISIS in there. <laughs>